Uh, <laughs> I don't know. My general view is, uh, how about you? Welcome to London Philosophy Talk. I'm Florian Steinberger of the Philosophy Department at Birkbeck College, University of London, and I'm also Director of the Philosophy Program at University of London Worldwide. In this first series of podcasts, I'll have the great pleasure to speak to some of my colleagues here at the Department of Philosophy at Birkbeck, who, as you'll see, are very smart and very wonderful. And we'll be talking about a host of different topics in all different areas of philosophy, for example, we'll be talking about the problem of imaginative resistance and the philosophy of fiction. We'll be talking about the status of moral intuitions and their role in ethical theorizing. We'll be talking about problems surrounding reference and the ascription of mental attitudes and the philosophy of language and mind. And we'll be talking about political philosophy, in particular the question as to whether some of us are just too incompetent to deserve a right to vote. Please note that these conversations have been recorded via Skype because of the COVID-19 induced lockdown. As a result of it, the sound quality may be less than optimal. I hope you will still find it listenable. My guest today is my colleague Stacy Friend. Aside from her position at Birkbeck, she's also president of the British Society of Aesthetics, and she organizes the London Aesthetics Forum at the Institute of Philosophy here at Senate House. Very relevantly to our topic today, she's also co-investigator of a Leverhulme Trust research project entitled Learning from Fiction. I hope you enjoy our discussion as much as I did. Right, so I'm here now with uh, my colleague Stacy, and we're going to talk today about imaginative resistance. So you might think that imaginative resistance is a good band name, but in fact it's an issue in the philosophy of fiction. So could you... To kick things off, just uh, explain to us what we mean by the problem of imaginative resistance. Sure, Florian. Um, the basic problem of imaginative resistance uh, was introduced by Kendall Walton with an example. And the example is very short fiction. So imagine this is the whole story. Um, Giselda killed her baby. She did the right thing. After all, it was a girl. And Walton argued that... Intuitively, we would resist imagining that Giselda had done the right thing. And indeed, we would even resist imagining that in the world of the fiction, Giselda had done the right thing. Because there's something about this that is so contrary to our moral assumptions that it prompts us to kind of step back and resist going along with the author. Right. And the, the thought is that oftentimes when we engage with fictions, we can imagine all sorts of outlandish things. We can imagine you know, talking donkeys and flying cars and all kinds of scenarios. Um, and we seem to be able to do that quite readily. But when it comes to certain kinds of propositions, and particularly in this case, morally deviant propositions or propositions we consider as such, we somehow experience this block where we're not able to go along with the story in the same way. That's right. And Walton and um, a lot of other people have thought it has something to do specifically with the evaluative realm. There's something about particularly moral concerns where we're not willing to give the author the same kind of poetic license as we are uh, concerning factual kinds of issues. So um, the author can make the fictional world very different from the actual world in all sorts of ways, but when it comes to moral judgments, uh, we don't let the author get away with anything. Right. So, so let me let me just ask a little bit about the two terms at play here: imaginative and and resistance. So, what exactly do we need? How how much engagement do we need when we're talking about imagination here? Imagination might mean that I'm actually creating a very vivid mental image of what's going on in the scene that's being described in a novel or different work of fiction. Or th there's, a, there's a much thinner sense of imagining where you're basically just accepting for the purposes of the fiction that something is true. You're not accepting it in the sense that you're committing yourself to its truth, but you're just sort of going along with it. And there, and, and perhaps there are sort of different um, degrees of imagining in between. What are we aiming for here? Is that clear? To be honest, I think it's not really clear in the discussions of imaginative resistance. Part of the reason that the 
debates hinge so much on examples like the Giselda case is that they probably work for almost any conception of imagining. Right. So even if it's very thin and you're just going along with the story, there's something about that statement that she was right because it was a girl that just causes you to pause in right. some way, um, even if you haven't been developing a very rich mental representation of what's being described, which you aren't in that case, of course, because it's only a couple of sentences. But it does seem as if the kind of imagining involved in imaginative resistance has to go beyond merely something like accepting or supposing something for the sake of argument. Because we can often suppose, I mean, if I said to you, suppose that it was okay that Giselda killed her baby because it was a girl, you as a philosopher would probably say, okay, what's the upshot of that argument? Where are we going with this, right? You wouldn't resist it in the relevant way. So something more seems to be at issue. What exactly is that issue is not clear. <laughs> right. Yeah, so l l let's take the, the second term, then resistance. I was, I was just uh, sort of naively thinking about the sorts of resistance that one might experience in trying to engage with a work of fiction. And one thing that I often have with uh, movies is that if you, for example, know anything about if you've ever played the piano or you played tennis or you know something about boxing, you just you can immediately tell by the way that somebody, an actor sits in front of a piano or you know, holds a tennis racket that no matter how much coaching time they might have had, don't know what they're doing. And immediately it sort of distances you and makes the whole thing a bit less credible. And likewise, in, you know, even in a novel, you might you might find that the author makes mistakes that don't seem to be deliberate. They're just, you know, mistakes that also kind of throw you off and they seem to undermine the the authority that the author otherwise might have. But that that, that seems to be what? Is, is that a, a weaker kind of resistance or does that still fall under the remit of, of the phenomenon that we're getting at? There's disagreement about that because of the disagreement about the nature of how to explain imaginative resistance. So different theories will take different views on whether those kinds of cases are related. My own view is that there's clearly a fam at least a family resemblance between those cases, at least with respect to something like the phenomenology, right? In both kinds of case, however we describe them, right. there's this feeling of distancing as you describe it. Elsewhere, Gendler calls this a kind, things sort of pop out at you in a certain kind of a way. Um, so you're going along with it you know, maybe you're very immersed imaginatively, maybe you're simply going along without paying close attention, but suddenly something strikes you as off. And it, generally speaking, has something to do with some fundamental disparity between the way things are in the fiction and the way that you expect them to be, given the way the actual world is. Right. And that's part of what's puzzling Right? I think it's a, it's a related puzzle in a certain way. What's puzzling is why we should care when we're so often going along with claims about the fictional world um, where they depart so much from the actual world. Why are there some cases in which that looks like a problem and why are there other cases in which it doesn't matter to us? Right. Well, perhaps it would make sense to um, start off before we go into Gendler's paper and the position that she there defends more more closely, and perhaps to distinguish, as you already started doing, between the different kinds of puzzles that sometimes get grouped together under the problem of um, imaginative resistance, of which I believe there are four, the imaginability yes. one that you already talked about, the fictionality one, the phenomenological one, and the aesthetic one. So can, can we just uh, perhaps go through those quickly and uh, distinguish them and, and, and to get a sense of how they interact and how perhaps different positions with respect to the puzzle might focus more on one or the other of these puzzles. Sure. Um, so let me start, I mean, let me just start with the phenomenological puzzle. Sure. In a way, this isn't a puzzle because it's more of an observation, right? right? right. There's this observation that you have a feeling of tension, a feeling of distancing and the sense of resistance to going along with what an author is saying. And I think that that's common to the cases of imaginative resistance. It's common to the cases that you describe where authors make certain kinds of mistakes that you recognize or things are not as you expect or how you think they should be. Yeah. So a lot, the, 
the solutions to the other puzzles, because the solutions are really not directed at the phenomenological puzzle, um, the solutions are really aiming to explain why we have this odd phenomenology right. in some cases and not in others by explaining other features which come under the other headings. So that's kind of the phenomenology question. The imaginability question, which is the one that is the, the focus of Gendler in her paper, The Puzzle of Imaginal Resistance, concerns our ability, or in her case, our willingness, but in any case, our resistance in some sense or other to imagining what the author is asking us to imagine. And it might be worth just saying that Gendler is presupposing, as pretty much everyone does in this debate, that authors ask us to imagine what they make true in their fictions. So if Gulliver travels to Lilliput, that means we're supposed to imagine that Gulliver travels to Lilliput. No one has any trouble imagining that Gulliver travels to Lilliput. You know, if Gulliver were stomping on small Lilliputians for fun and Swift told us that this was the right thing to do, then we would probably experience this imaginative resistance. We wouldn't want to imagine that or we wouldn't be able to imagine that it was the right thing to do. That's the the idea of imaginative resistance. Now, that's very closely related to what's called the fictionality puzzle, which Brian Weatherson also calls the alethic puzzle. And that's the puzzle of whether we accept what the author tells us as being true in the fictional world or fictional in the fictional world um, in Walton's terminology. And I'll give you an example of where these seem to come apart. So you might think, for the sake of argument, you might think it's not possible to imagine squaring a circle. So in whatever sense of imagination, you want, maybe you could suppose it, but there's some richer sense of imagining in which you might think, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to imagine squaring a circle. Yep. But if I write a story in which it says that Harry Houdini, in his last magic act, squared a circle, right, and everyone cheered, you might be happy to say that that is true in the fiction. You don't know how to imagine it, right? But right. it seems to be true in the fiction. Um, and... So you might think these things can come apart, right? It might be that there are things you can't imagine, but you're willing to take them as true in the fiction. When Walton introduced his Giselda case, he argued that we're not willing to take that as true in the fiction. So it's not just that we don't want to imagine it or we can't imagine it. It's that we simply refuse to allow the author to establish it as a moral truth within his fictional world that Giselda did the right thing, right? And Walton thought, and I actually agree with this, that the fictionality puzzle is in a way the hardest one because people might differ a lot in their abilities to imagine things or their desires to imagine things, but it's very unusual to refuse an author license to establish whatever they want to be the case in their fictional world. And that's like a very deep puzzle um, in a certain way, I think. So the last puzzle is the aesthetic puzzle, or maybe the aesthetic question. And this is actually the origin of the entire debate, because it was the aesthetic question that David Hume was raising in his his paper um, on the standard of taste, which is is the origin of this entire discussion. And what what Hume says there is that if... um, If a fiction, or indeed a nonfiction, if a work of literature asks us to enter into vicious attitudes, to accept that um, morally deviant claims are true, as we would put it now, then the work is flawed in that respect. It's aesthetically flawed. It's not as good as it would be if it accorded with the appropriate morality. And Hume himself was thinking about uh, works of literature, for example, by Homer, uh, where the actions of Achilles are praised when we would consider them to be absolutely horrific. Right. If you see it by our current standards, and he thought that was an aesthetic flaw. I see. So you, you, you can kind of see how the, if you go along with Hume and you think that a work of art 
would be compromised as a result of its inclusion of such uh, propositions that caused this imaginative resistance. You, you you could see how the how that aesthetic judgment would be linked to the phenomenological puzzle and certainly also to the imaginability puzzle. Right? If you if you can't engage with a work of fiction in in the right kind of way on account of the fact that it involves us being invited to 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 take on board these repugnant moral propositions then there's a, there's a kind of distance which which you, you one would see why it would we would somehow diminish the aesthetic value of the of the work in question so yeah and i oh just, sorry yeah no so no i was just, i was trying to understand how how they might fit together and and what the connections might be that's right and i think and I was just going to say we can also bring in the fictionality puzzle there as well, yeah. because when the author loses their authority, as it were, over the reader, that does look like a flaw in the work, um, because they're not bringing us along, right? So you you might be able to set aside imaginability. You might say, oh, well, people these days aren't willing to enter into um, an interesting work because they they have particular moral views. Right. And that's neither here nor there with respect to the value of the work. But if the author is somehow impeded in determining the content of their own work, if we're unwilling to accept that they have the authority over their own work, that looks like a, a significant flaw. Right. And perhaps we should make clear that if we, in a case like the Giselle example, that that seems to suggest that female infanticide is okay. What's what's really causing the resistance and the problem there is not merely that the author, or sorry, that that the narrator, narrator perhaps in this case, is expressing some kind of moral view, but that we take it to be an invitation to share in the holding of that moral view. Right? It's not. It's not only that we as it were, sit here like anthropologists and, and we say, well, in this culture or in this fiction, these people hold these views. That's bizarre. But hey, <laughs> you know, what a curious phenomenon. No, I mean, what presumably is or what's really at the cause of this tension and, uh, of the resistance is that, moreover, it, there's supposed to be some kind of contagion between the, the, the world of fiction and, and the real world that causes the problem. Absolutely. Run. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that our default attitude is to assume that it's that the that there's something shared, right? And so that there's an automatic default invitation to join in the attitudes that are being expressed. I mean, in this case, of course, the Giselda case, and most of the examples that are discussed in this debate are very short, artificially constructed little stories and yeah. not full um, works of literature, but. The default seems to be to take this to be a kind of omniscient narrator who's simply stating how things are, right? As opposed to um, a first person narrator whom you might simply think, oh, well, I disagree with this narrator. And and often you assume that the author disagrees with the narrator too and when they plant reprehensible or crazy views in the narrator's mouth, right? Yeah. Um, but in this case, it doesn't seem to be much room for that. That's not your initial reaction. Your initial reaction is to assume that this is supposed to just be establishing how things are, and you are invited to think that that is how things are in, in the world of the fiction, and somehow to go along with it. And you, refu you refuse or you're unable to do so, depending on your view of what's going on there. Right. Yeah. No, so there, there are two points that I quickly wanted to pick up on, because I was thinking of those when we were talking about it. And one is the issue that you just mentioned regarding the narrator and the idea that really, I mean, there always has to be some element of interpretation going on, right? It might be that I'm a, just because I'm a very poor reader, I'm experiencing perhaps even the phenomenological puzzle and the imaginability puzzle, and I'm experiencing this, this imaginative resistance on all, all sorts of fronts. And that's merely because I'm a poor reader and I'm failing to recognize that what I take to be an invitation to adopt a particular view that I regard as repugnant is really some kind of stylistic technique that the that the author might be using. And it might not at all be the case that the author is really advocating that view or inviting us to share in that view. So you, you might have, you know, an, an unreliable narrator, or it, it just might not be clear whether or not the views put forth by 
you know, Levin and Anna Karenina with her all his musings about, you know, what happiness consists in and, and religion and all the rest of it. It's never so clear to what extent it's just some genius character that Tolstoy has created or to what extent Tol these were actually the views that Tolstoy himself held. And, and so it, it seems that we always have to make these interpretive judgments and that uh, the puzzles that we face are always going to be relative to the interpretive choices that we make. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, and again, this is something that I think tends to be obscured by the fact that the debate concerns short, um, artificially constructed stories, yeah. because the point of those stories is to elicit <laughs> imaginative resistance. Um, and in the in the in the real world of reading literature, we're much less likely to resist, usually because some story is created in a certain way that either leads us to understand why things are the way that they initially appear wrongly to be, you know, or makes us think that it's a narrator or a character's point of view, which right. isn't necessarily one we're being invited to share. So, I mean, another really good example of this where it's, it's highly ambiguous and difficult is Lolita. <laughs> yes. Because, so, I mean, speaking of inattentive readers, so it, it's, it's certainly a mistake to attribute to Nabokov, Humbert Humbert's views about pedophilia, right? So that there's no question that's an interpretive error. So if I remember right, that, that novel is, is is told from the first person perspective yes. of the the person with the pseudonym Humbert Humbert, who is the who is the pedophile in question, the pedophile in question who 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 gets yeah. accused of murder at the end, and yeah, and and it it would certainly be a rather crude reading to to somehow identify the author even in part with character. Yes, um, but what's what's ambiguous, I mean, part of what's very interesting about Lolita is the extent to which we're invited to be sympathetic to Humbert Humbert, uh, even if we don't simply identify the narrator with the actual author. Um, it remains, um, one remains very ambivalent throughout the work because Humbert Humbert is so sympathetic and amusing in certain kinds of ways. Um, and so you are, to some extent, invited to sympathize with him in ways that become uncomfortable, uh, right. given, <laughs> right. given no, the that, situation. No, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating thing. But I want to I come back to that because I wanted to talk about right. how this relates to ethical criticisms of art and, and, of course, the examples of empathetic or even sympathetic villains are, um, exactly. are really interesting and, and fun to talk about. But let's... We we should finally get to the paper at some point, but there's there's <laughs> <laughs> but there there's one more thing that I wanted to pick up on, which which obviously relates to the paper and what we just talked about the question of interpretation and perhaps also the question of genre is something that that Gendler picks up on briefly towards the end of the paper, so we're not completely off topic here. But one one other thing, because you mentioned Hume and Hume's go to examples being the Homeric epic, and I was wondering whether. You would agree, and most authors would agree, given how they describe their intuitions here, that when it comes to works of fiction that are further removed from us in time, or perhaps even geographically, I'm not sure, we are, I suppose I, I experience less of a resistance there and less of an invitation to join in, just because to really appreciate what goes on in the Iliad, for example, you really have to understand you know, the sorts of concepts that are central to the warrior culture that they deal in, you know, the concept of glory and battle, the Cleos and Time and all the rest of it. And you, you really have to sort of understand it. And it's not as if once we understand it, we'd be like, oh, yeah, that, that seems like a good idea. We should we should get some of that back. No, I mean, obviously, a lot of what they do, the, the pillaging and raping and all of that is absolutely horrible. But nevertheless, we seem in some sense less threatened by it because it seems further removed, more alien to us. And as a result of that, it seems to me, our defense mechanisms seem to be um, less um, less affected or less called upon. Does that? I, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, Hume comes off as unusually as a bit of a prude when he, <laughs> when he talks about these kinds of cases. I mean, I think there's no question that phenomenologically, the more distant um, a work seems to be from our own culture, um, preconceptions, the, the less resistant we are, um, which is kind of odd because it's actually works of that kind 
um, where it's harder for us to adopt the relevant attitudes in a way, or you would think that'd be harder for us to adopt the attitudes because they're so foreign to our ordinary attitudes. Um, And yet those are the cases in which we're least least concerned somehow about going along with it. We go willingly along. Um, We go willingly along with revenge plots, for example, in Hamlet. You know, n- nobody's shedding any tears by the end. I, I, I'm not really in favor of vigilantism and murdering everybody and vengeance, and yet it's reassuring there I to am hear, cheering. given that you're my colleague. <laughs> Don't betray me. Um, anyway, uh, so I think that's a really interesting feature of the situation that is, it's not clear that the standard solutions to the puzzles fully address that. Right. Actually. Okay. Okay, well, well, let's perhaps um, yeah. finally um, let, let me steer us towards the, the the paper, and then perhaps we can come back to that question because okay. it, yeah, because I I think it is interesting that even though these 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 cultures and and the mores described there and perhaps even advocated are most distant from us, somehow they don't seem to pose the same threat than ones that perhaps are culturally less distant. And perhaps this idea of a defense mechanism has, I don't know, but we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that and see how it, how it fits into the, to the paper. So, right. So the, the paper we're discussing is, is Gendler's 2000 paper in Journal of Philosophy, a puzzle, uh, no, the puzzle of imaginative uh, resistance. So given what we've, given how you've helped us set the stage and helped us understand what, what, what the phenomenon is that we're trying to get at, can you uh, quickly sketch for us where she comes down and what what the explanation is that she offers of the phenomenon and perhaps what the what her focal points are sure so gendler is concerned primarily with the imaginability puzzle the fact that we resist imagining certain things um but she thinks that's closely tied to the fictionality puzzle because we're supposed to imagine what's fictionally the case um so she doesn't clearly distinguish those two puzzles in the original paper that's a later distinction What she wants to argue are a couple of points. One, she wants to argue that the moral case is special, that there's a special resistance that arises in the moral case that doesn't arise in other cases like the ones that you discussed earlier, so that it's a different phenomenon from other kinds of cases, um, which we can discuss those other kinds of cases later. And then she wants to argue that the standard kind of explanation, for for example, the explanation that Walton gives in his earlier paper that prompts her discussion um, is a kind of conceptual impossibility explanation. That is, when confronted by something like the Giselda case, our problem is that we can't imagine it. So we are unable to imagine that this is right. And Gendler wants to argue that that cannot be the right explanation because she thinks we can imagine that which is impossible. So even conceptually impossible. We're capable of doing that. So that can't be the explanation in the other case. And she makes that argument with a very famous story called the Tower of Goldbach, in which I won't bore you with the story, but it's a somewhat lengthy story relative to philosophy uh, fictions in which ultimately God decrees that seven plus twelve both equal seven. Sorry, seven <laughs> plus five both equals twelve and does not equal twelve. So, in a kind of Solomonic settling of a dispute, he simply gives both sides uh, the right to say, as it were, seven plus five is twelve, but also it is the case that seven plus five is not twelve. And Gendler takes it uh, correctly, I think, to be a conceptual impossibility. That 7 plus 5 is not 12, or that it can be both 12 and not 12. But she thinks that if you read the story, you'll agree that you can imagine that 7 plus 5 both is and isn't 12. And she also thinks that it's clearly fictionally the case in the story that 7 plus 5 both is and isn't 12. Right. So using that example, she excludes the, po- the idea that it's conceptual impossibility that causes us to be to not imagine the, that it's morally right to kill girls in the Giselda case. And what she does then is argue for what she later calls a Wontian, that is, 
a refusal account. So it's not that we can't, that's the Kantian account, it's not that we can't imagine it, right. it's that we won't imagine it. We refuse to imagine that it's morally right um, to kill a baby because it's a girl. And her explanation for this is that, at least in the moral case, when an author sets out a certain kind of moral framework or moral assumptions in their work, they simultaneously ask us to imagine it as part of the fictional world and to buy into it as true in the actual world. And she thinks that this is in some ways unique to the moral realm because that is a realm of negotiation between the author and readers. It's not something the author has control over by themselves. So there's this idea that when the author makes a moral pronouncement or perhaps even just implies a moral perspective within the work, um, we are simultaneously supposed to export that perspective to the actual world. And when we think we don't want to do that, we would, we would not like to have that view of the actual world. That's when we resist. So that's her account. Right. Great. Thanks. So let me just um, perhaps go back to the, these two approaches. Right? We, we have the phenomenon of imaginative resistance. We come across these phenomena in literature and we resist somehow. And the question is, is it because we just can't imagine or is it the case that we somehow refuse to for one reason or another? Exactly. And so perhaps try to um, motivate a bit more the, the view that she attacks the Kantist approach that, that was championed by Walton and then, and then various other people after him, just to make it a bit more plausible and to see where, where she's coming from. So I, I think the way she sets it up, if I remember right, was, was to say that, look, there's believing and there's make-believing, which we have in fiction, and beliefs are such that, just by dint of the types of mental states that they are, that we can't simply believe willy-nilly whatever we choose. Right. Even if you offer me some sort of cash reward of a thousand pounds, if I <laughs> all, you know, if, if immediately I come to believe that, I don't know, Vienna is not the capital of Austria or something, um, I can claim or I can profess not to believe it anymore, but I can't simply cease to believe it. It's just not something that I that's under my control in that kind of way. And so belief is supposed to be constrained by truth in, 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 in some fundamental way. And that's partly constitutive of what makes it that kind of mental state. And then she goes on to say, well, perhaps, and I think that's that's how she she motivates the the, the Walton view, perhaps it's the case that make-believe gives us a lot more leeway. We can make-believe all kinds of things that certainly aren't true, right? So all kinds of things that you can make-believe um, in, in stories and fairy tales and all the rest of it. But even that mental state of make-believe, and we'll have to understand exactly how how that relates to imagining, whether it's the same thing, I'm not entirely sure, you'll tell me. But when it comes to make-believe, that too is constrained. It gives We have a lot more leeway, but it, it also is constrained by something like conceptual, what's conceptually possible. And the idea is that when we encounter something like a claim that female infanticide is the right thing to do or is more morally acceptable, that is just an instance of something that is conceptually impossible. Now, why why should it be conceptually impossible in the first place? I mean, you you, you can see in the example that that Gendler gives and that you were just talking about, she gives the exam an, an arithmetical example where all of a sudden seven plus five does not lo, no longer equal twelve, and it's pretty easy to see how that's a conceptual impossibility because we think, well, okay, you can claim that, but if you claim that, it must be that you no longer attach the same meanings to the words five, seven plus, and all the rest of it than I do. Right. And that must explain how you how you reach that conclusion. And so it's how, how does that carry over to the to the moral case? And how, how do these morally deviant propositions, how are they supposed to be conceptually impossible in an analogous way? It's not at all clear. I mean, I think that one of the reasons I find um, the way that Gendler argues a little bit odd is because I think she she could have just said it's pretty obviously not conceptually impossible, <laughs> right? Um, it doesn't look like a conceptual impossibility. That doesn't look like the right um, explanation of what's going on. And indeed, it's not really how Walton argues right. for the claim. Um, the kind of impossibility that's at issue that that Walton considers, and then later 
Brian Weatherson uh, defends as well, is a, cl is a claim about the way in which moral judgments or evaluative judgments or even what the what we can just for the moment call higher level judgments yeah. depend on certain kinds of lower level facts so that if you change the lower level facts in certain ways then the higher level judgments must follow and so walton's thought is that you know if you leave everything else the same as it is in the ordinary world in the in the actual world um the moral facts supervene on the ordinary facts, he, he assumes. Right. And so if the ordinary facts are as they are, then the moral facts can't change in this radical way. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Right. For our listeners, so, just, so when you say supervene, there's a, there's a certain kind of dependency between moral facts, like something like um, female infanticide is right. Right. That's a moral Ooh. claim. It has that word right, which is very normatively laden. It tells us what is right or wrong or what one ought to do or ought not to do, or one might infer that. So that's one of these higher level propositions. And the idea is that those propositions don't um, fly free, right? They're, they're somehow connected. They, they depend in, in important ways on factual stuff that are just you know, descriptive facts about the world that don't involve... Uh, normatively laden vocabulary of that sort, and yes, so, you, so you can't you can't as it were leave you can't have a story where uh, nothing changes about the ordinary descriptive stuff about the world, but all of a sudden you come to completely different moral claims about the world, or vice versa. You can't just change the moral claims. You can't say all of a sudden, oh, female infanticide is right, without also making it the case that the actions that you can simply describe that people do all of a sudden are, are, are would have to be very different in order to explain how it could be that that dependency relation still works in the right kind of way. Is that is that going the right way? That's right. So it's not, I, I mean, I'll come back to get the way Gendler wants to use her conceptual impossibility, but the kind of impossibility, the people who defend the Kantian view. Yeah are not really defending something like it's conceptually possible in the sense of, of or impossible in the sense of being like logically impossible yeah. in the way seven plus five and 12. Um, so let me give a couple of other cases that highlight the kind of dependency relation, Great. because sometimes yeah. the way in which the moral facts depend on the descriptive facts is a little bit obscure. <laughs> I just noticed um, that when I was trying to explain it. Yeah. Yes, it is, but it is a, a more obscure kind of case. So Stephen Yablo has a very nice case also in the evaluative realm, realm but this time um, in the aesthetic realm. So he says, leave everything as it is. Um, the, follow, you, the following claim can't be something that you imagine or take to be fictionally the case, that a monster truck rally is as beautiful as the setting sun. <laughs> right. Because given the kind of thing that a monster truck rally and what, hap what happens in the monster truck rally, it's not something you can simply declare to be beautiful. It has to be beautiful in virtue of features of the scene, right? And if they are the features of an ordinary monster truck rally, they won't count as beautiful. That's Yablo's idea. Right. And, and, and so that's, that, that, that's not just a, a, a judgment from some elitist East Coast University academic type who, who, who can't get excited about monster truck rallies. The idea is that even if, you, if you're really into monster truck rallies, you might find all sorts of great things about it. You might find it exciting or exhilarating, or, but, but it's not going to be beautiful. There's just something confusing. Beautiful isn't the right term. And you can, you can do this with lots of other cases. So um, take the Mona Lisa it's in virtue of the way in which Leonardo da Vinci put paint to canvas, right? That um, her smile seems mysterious, that the painting is somehow, um, well, beautiful, of course, but also elegant in a certain kind of a way. It's not garish. It's not awkward, right? It's, those are higher level descriptions of, of paintings. Some paintings are, in fact, garish and awkward yeah. right Indeed. but it isn't and that's in virtue of the way it, it looks in the more basic at the more basic level and so these evaluative judgments somehow turn on these much more lower level facts and you can't just stipulate a change in the higher level evaluative judgment 
without also changing the lower level facts that the judgment depends on. I will take one more example, which might uh, be nice. It doesn't involve any potential aesthetic elitism. Um, he says, you know, someone writes a story in which um, the, a character says a really terrible knock-knock joke, right? Oh, Just yes, yeah. really stupid. And, it, and then the narrative declares as the funniest joke that's ever been told. And Walton just thinks you can't make that the case. Like you can't render a, you know, an obviously stupid knock-knock joke to be the funniest joke that's ever been told, even in a fiction, right? Oh, and that's just fiction, because, right? I mean, the, the facts about the knock-knock joke and its stupidity preclude the higher level judgment that it's, you know, the wittiest thing that anyone has ever said. But so, I don't know. Yeah. When I when I read about that example, I was just thinking whether mm. whether that's really true. Whether you know whether you couldn't imagine a situation where I don't know some some well known I don't know Sarah Silverman or, or Dave Chappelle or something, if they actually went on stage and 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 said a joke like that, just the gap between the expectation and the reality of that joke might actually turn out to be really funny in the context. True, but right. it's important that Walton says in his, when he's setting this up, and this is what's relevant to the argument, if you leave everything else the same. So he's not assuming that, you know, you can write it so it's not assuming that it's someone who's a brilliant comedian who develops certain expectations and so on and does it as a joke, as a joke about a joke, as it were. Yeah. Right. But in ordinary circumstances where someone says that and then it's announced that that's extremely witty, you just won't buy that as, as witty. And those are the evaluative cases. Another kind of case, which is quite relevant because Gendler is determined that the moral case is special. And Kantians tend to argue the moral case is not special. There's lots of other cases yeah. uh, um, where the phenomenon arises. One of my favorite cases which is not evaluative, but also displays this, this problem of dependency in a certain kind of way, um, is a case from Stephen Yablo, who tells a story in which people are on a scavenger hunt. The last thing they need to find on their list is an oval. One of the characters holds up a five-fingered maple leaf and announces they found it, and they won, they win the prize because right. they found the oval. And it does look, I don't know if it's impossible, but it seems very, very difficult, maybe impossible, yeah. to imagine that a five-fingered maple leaf can be an oval. There's something about the shape of an oval <laughs> such that a five-fingered maple leaf cannot be that. Yeah. And that looks, in some way, it does look kind of conceptually impossible to imagine that, or it seems impossible to conceive of it, but not in the way of 7 plus 5 equals 12 and doesn't equal 12. It's a different kind of impossibility. Right. And it's um, harder to see why we would refuse such a thing, why, why it's something that we won't do. It's, it seems that it's, it's, it's a different kind of phenomenon. Exactly. So the refusal, um, the Wontian approach that Gendler advocates um, is much more plausible for the moral case because there's something about ourselves and our own ethical sense that are at stake in, in our doing this in a way that you could see why we'd refuse it. Whereas in these other cases, um, which is one of the reasons the Kantians often talk about these other kinds of cases, it doesn't look plausible that there's any refusal involved at all. Right. Uh, there's no reason to refuse it. Right. Um, just out of curiosity, do you think that that would extend the Wontian case which, as you say, is a sort of tailor made for the for imaginative resistance in the case of ethically deviant propositions. Do you think it carries over to the ethics of belief? Do you think propositions about think... you know propositions about standards of rationality? If somebody tells you that it's a really good way to form your beliefs by I don't know reading tea leaves or consulting right. I don't know hand readers or something, you know if they if and if someone if an author were to credibly invite one to to go along with that as it were do you think it, it would bring about a kind mm. of resistance that is explicable or that that is readily explained by the by the sort of wontian gendler gendlerian approach oh that's interesting 
I, I don't know. I mean, take in the Harry Potter novels, there are a variety of, of methods of acquiring knowledge, which are ones that we would reject. I mean, there are people who are essentially clairvoyant, right. for example. Um, there are people who read tea leaves <laughs> with some success. And I don't have, I mean, I don't have any resistance to going along with the idea that in the world of the Harry Potter novels, these are ways of acquiring knowledge. Right. That's interesting okay. because, it, it, yeah, it might be that our reactions there might be genre dependent in a way that maybe moral ones aren't. Right. If we think that it's if it's, it's a really realistic narrative and we think that somebody really is, a, is making you know, ridiculous claims about, about how one ought to to go about forming reasonably for, forming one's beliefs and and really is av- advocating that we might perhaps perceive that as a threat in a certain kind of way like we would in the moral case whereas if it's a you know if it's a, a kind of science fiction or, or some kind of fantasy narrative where we're quite happy to impute to to the characters all kinds of fantastic abilities then it doesn't seem to interfere with our concerns about <laughs> rational belief in the same kind of way that's exactly right. And it's interesting, though, because Gendler herself, toward the end of the paper, where you had mentioned she talks a bit about genre, yeah. and she focuses on what she calls non-distorting fictions, which are roughly realistic fictions, as the kind that seem to be at issue in giving us the most resistance. So she's acknowledging the fact that you might have less resistance in a case where you think that the work is somehow fantastical. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an interesting fact that I, I mean, I think that it's probably the case that we are more conservative morally than we are, say, epistemically in this respect. So we probably are less likely, I mean, if it turned out, like the Harry Potter novels are written from the point of view of Lucius Malfoy, one of the bad ones. (laughs) Right. I, 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 you keep getting an empty stare from me because I'm 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 not at all I, I rather, Harry Potter educated. From the, from the wrong side, uh, <laughs> the bad people, the evil ones. I see. Um, if if it were like that, it had a flipped morality. I think we'd be more we'd be less likely to go along with it than we are likely to go along with the idea that people can use clairvoyance to find things out or witchcraft or or whatever. Right. But on the other hand, I'm not, I mean, it's not clear. So Gendler's example is the Adams family. Right. Where, where the kind of what counts as right and wrong is more or less the opposite in a very amusing way to what we normally count as right and wrong. And we go along with that. And her explanation of that is that it's sort of manifestly distorting on purpose. Right. But, of course, that really does raise the question why we shouldn't look at morally deviant cases as manifestly distorting, right? So her thought is that there are these cases where we just, for whatever reason, but let's assume we're even justified in thinking that we're being invited to export these these moral claims to the real world. Yeah. And the Adams family, because it's so manifestly done for a joke and so on. Right? It's clearly not asking us to export these attitudes to the real world. And so we go along with it. I suspect that that's what's part of what's at issue in the case of the Homeric epics is that it's not because of the intention of the author or authors in that case, but because it's so distant, we don't think of it as an invitation to export these attitudes. So we treat it as a kind of distorting fiction where it's okay to temporarily adopt the attitudes and go along with it. Because there's no threat to how we actually feel in the real world. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. So, okay, so now we have got a a better grasp of what the Kantian, which has nothing to do with the manual again. It's it's yes, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's the position that holds that imaginative resistance comes about because we can't, we're unable to do so, as opposed to being unwilling to do so, and so we have a better grasp of what that position might amount to, and and we've seen that perhaps it's a bit different from the position that Gendler actually attacks in her paper. And we've seen that Gendler's focus is more narrow 
and that she's concerned primarily with, or solely, I suppose, with morally deviant propositions. And so there's the different ways in which you might look at the dialectical situation, right? You might think, is it the case that Gendler's in a way cheating? There's really this broad spectrum of phenomena, moral deviance being one cause of imaginative resistance. But there are these other ones, other evaluative domains, aesthetic and, and different ones where we encounter similar phenomena. And she's just stubbornly focusing on one little aspect of it because her theory fits that one really nicely to the exclusion of the others, right? That's a rather uncharitable way of looking at it. Yeah. Or you you might you might say, no, 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 actually imaginative resistance is primarily caused by the moral cases. And these other cases are perhaps somehow, you know, there's some kind of family resemblance, but it's not really part of the same phenomenon. And it's only because you're wedded to this mistaken explanation of the phenomenon, right? The Cantist phenomenon that, that tries to see that there's some kind of impossibility because, because of these dependency relations that aren't respected within the fiction. And that if you have that view, then it's very natural to think of all these other cases, all these other domains of being of a kind, and of, to think of imaginative resistance born out of ethical propositions as, as just being one aspect of this broader phenomenon. But that's just because you're bought into the wrong explanation in the first place. That's why it, it looks so plausible to you that there's really a broader spectrum of phenomena to be explained here. So do you think there's a way of adjudicating that independently of the of where one stands with respect to these positions um i don't i think that there isn't i mean i think there there's so my own view is that there's a range of phenomena in which there's resistance right and they include and i i mean i find it difficult to see why we should deny that they include cases in which we refuse right and cases in which we're unable okay right. to do it right? right um and it seems as if you know, in the genus, there might be different species of cases with different kinds of explanations that are relevant to what's going on in each case. Now, I mean, my own view is that what ties them together is is really this assumption that the that there's a realistic background involved. And it's it's when we assume a certain kind of realistic background that we have this difficulty, right? whatever it might be. And this is, I think, why this is why I have a very broad conception of the phenomenon that encompasses the kinds of cases that you discussed at the beginning, um, where authors have made certain kinds of errors, or actors are doing certain kinds of things which they're not really doing, or it's very clear they're not doing. I think we experience something similar precisely because we have expectations that a, a work will be accurate in certain respects. And when it fails to be accurate in the respects that we anticipate, we experience this resistance. And that would explain why in the case of the Adams family, even for the ethical, we don't experience resistance because we don't expect it to be accurate in that, in that particular way. It's manifestly not supposed to be accurate. I think the reason the moral cases and the like very conceptual impossibility cases look particularly hard to go along with is because we don't think the moral realm varies with possible worlds, and we don't think the conceptual realm varies, as it were, with possible worlds. We don't think that among the possibilities are ones in which the moral is completely different, or the conceptual is completely different. Yeah. Or seven plus, we think seven plus five equals 12 in all of the possible worlds, right? Um, so it's very hard to dislodge our assumption that it's just like the real world when it comes to moral facts and certain kinds of of mathematical or logical facts with other kinds of facts where a lot it's easier for us if you convince me that it's not supposed to be realistic in a certain way i am going to be willing to go along with you but it's going to be harder to convince me of that for certain kinds of facts right. but what's really i think what's really doing the work is this presumption that it's supposed to be like the real world in some respect or another I mean, there seems to be a really subtle, tacit communication between the author or the narrator and the person engaging with the fiction. And it seems like there's some principles or maxims at play, which would be very difficult to make explicit, just like it's very difficult, for example, to make explicit the maxims that govern successful communication. But nevertheless, where if you are a good reader or a good consumer of fiction, you are very sensitive to them and you're a good interpreter of fiction. 
And if you're a good author, you're, you're able to play with those in ways that don't upset expectations, at least on the whole. But of course, art is, is also such that it, it always tries to subvert yes. expectations and, and play with genres and, and lead you into ways of thinking that you're dealing with a realist scenario and then all of a sudden it becomes a exactly. magical realist scenario or something and exactly. something crazy happens. And, and that can be successful or it cannot be successful. And it's very interesting to see when it works, how the author goes about manipulating these sort of maxims in ways that still make it work and where we just look baffled and think what the hell is going on? This is, <laughs> they, they sort of broke the contract, the agreement we had here and, and you're just off the rails now. Yeah, and there are a lot of different kinds of cases. I mean, one of the things you mentioned was mistakes as opposed to deliberate distortions. So one thing that happens with mistakes is we think that the author thinks the real world is a certain way and that's why... Yeah. They said such and such in their fictional world. And because we know the real world's not like that, right? That's a mistake. Then we have resistance. But other case, but when they're deliberately toying with us, like the magical realist case, and we get the sense that this is on purpose, the departures from reality are on purpose in a certain way, but not meant to be taken to be accurate about the real world, then yeah. we are willing to go along. And there's a case that I really like to discuss in this in this context that shows the subtlety of of exactly the interpretive issues that you've described. And this is the case of um, it's a very famous case of Crook's death in Bleak House in Dickens's novel Bleak House. So the character Crook dies from spontaneous combustion, which is described in detail. I mean he. He essentially burns from within due to his sins uh, and, his, and his evil. And it's stated very explicitly by an omniscient narrator. Right? There's no question yeah. that this is how he died. It is spontaneous combustion. It is nothing else. I mean, that's what it says. And at the time, Dickens was absolutely lambasted by people of the time. It's not that people thought there was spontaneous combustion, but Dickens thought so. Because there are cases, there are scientifically discussed cases of people who appear to spontaneously combust. Really? And he, was, he actually believed it? He had studied it. Interesting. Um, he had studied all the scientific papers about this. He believed it was true. When he came to uh, put, you know, it was produced as a serial, like all his novels. When he came to, to um, publish it as an edition, he had an entire forward in which he cited all of the proof and argued that there was, in fact, spontaneous combustion. Fascinating. Which, I had no idea. Which there isn't, of course. <laughs> uh, and what's interesting about it is that there, any reader, including Dickens's, most of Dickens's contemporaries, right, will experience resistance to going along with the idea that Crook has died of spontaneous combustion. And one of the reasons, of course, is that Dickens' novels are notoriously physically realistic in every other respect. This is the one and only anomaly <laughs> to physical realism yeah. in Dickens. And notice how subtle this is, because Dickens is not realistic in all ways, right? So people who are crooks aren't usually named crook, right? Orphans don't usually end up having benefactors who save them. The good people don't win out in the end in all the cases, right? So... Dickens is full of coincidences and sentimentality and all kinds of aspects in which it's not really realistic. But in this way, scientifically, with respect to the physical realm, right, and in certain ways, like the economic realm as well, Dickens is, is systematically realistic. And that's part of what causes us to stop and go, wait a minute. And then it's even worse when we find out he really thought that's, that was true. <laughs> that's really interesting. I had no idea. I'm tempted to, to roll out other examples like that, but perhaps that, that would that would take us too far abroad. But I've been taking up quite a bit of your time. But if if you still have a few minutes, I want to just sure. I wanted us to perhaps explore a few ways can learn from this discussion. And we've given a bit of a survey of the uh, phenomenon and what people say about it and of the paper. But what do we learn about, in particular, perhaps imagination and and well, there's there's other things we can talk about. Let's start there. So, I mean, a, a number of people think that the various phenomena around imaginative resistance tells us something important about the distinction between imagining and supposing. Right. 
So supposing looks like something you can do with anything. You can suppose anything. And as you know, as a logician, you can suppose something for the purpose of reductio. So you can suppose a contradiction, explicit contradiction. Um, and it doesn't seem so far-fetched that you can suppose that, you know, if I said you suppose female infanticide were right, what else would be true or something like that? Yeah. You would just treat that as a supposition within which to work out some philosophical implication. So the fact that we experience resistance is often taken to be a mark that imagination, whatever it is, is something richer in some respect or other than merely supposing. Exactly how it's richer and what to say about that is still kind of up in the air. But that's one of the implications people take from this discussion. It's interesting that we it somehow seems to be more committal, right? Yes, yes. You have to be able, I mean, this is related to um, another topic that Gendler has a real interest in, which is the relationship between imaginability or conceivability and possibility. Yeah. And, and this again goes back to Hume. Hume said that what was conceivable was, was possible. And it's widely thought by people who think that this is right, that what's meant here is not merely supposition, because again, you can suppose a contradiction for the purpose of refuting it. So that can't be a guide to possibility. There needs to be a richer sense of something like filling in and drawing out a coherent scenario. Right. Elaborating the details in a way that continues to be coherent no matter how detailed you get in whichever direction you go. So an example of that is something like time travel stories. Right. So on the assumption, which I'm just going to take for granted for now, that time travel is not possible... Uh, of course, there are many fictions in which we seem to be able to imagine time travel because we go right along with those. Fictions. And so it's just just, uh, just to say it's not possible because if it were possible, I could go back, be my own grandfather or something like that, and then I wouldn't be who I am and, and, and that kind of thing. Exactly. And that's exactly the kind of case and the kind of example that shows why the kind, at least the kind of imagining that's relevant to determining what something is possible, it allows you to keep elaborating the scenario in a way that continues to be coherent. Right. What you've just described is a way of elaborating a time travel scenario that leads you immediately into a contradiction. Yeah. Right. And so because it's not obvious when you read a well-constructed fiction, but when you start thinking, anyone who starts thinking about the implications of the time travel in a fiction will quickly realize, no, that wouldn't work. Right. Right. And so it's that kind of imagining, imagining that's related to at least to possibility has something to do with this ability to spin out a scenario in more and more detail. And a successful time travel fiction is one in which it feels as if many details are being addressed. Right. And, and you're somehow prevented from going any further in the directions that would lead to contradictions. Right. So does that imaginability or conceivability in that sense, would that basically presuppose logical omniscience? Because oh. if, if it really is the case that for something to be possible, it has to be or if it is imaginable that it's possible, then you know, if I can imagine for example, that there's a counterexample because we we mentioned Goldbach's conjecture, which is the conjecture that for any even number greater than four is the sum of two prime numbers. So if, if I can imagine that that is false, yeah. Well, imagining that that is false would actually have to be be I have to be able to produce a counterexample. Because, yeah, you know, I I think that's a really good question. I don't I don't know. Um, the, I mean, the test seems to work only to determine that things are impossible within the scope of our capacity to get to that point, right? right. So it only helps us um, when we confront a contradiction by trying to spin out the scenario. Right. Then we think, okay. But an example of this, so someone who has argued at length that conceivability um, entails possibility is David Chalmers. And of course, he thinks that Zombies, not in the science fiction sense, but in the philosophical, <laughs> philosophical sense. Zombies, yeah. Philosophical zombies who are physically exactly like us, um, but who have no phenomenal experience, no subjective experience or consciousness of that kind. Um, so Chalmers thinks that it's possible, and he, you know, insists that no matter how much you think about a possible world in which there are zombies, you won't confront a contradiction right. 
in spinning that out. And it's not entirely clear how to adjudicate that claim or what counts as a contradiction in that scenario. But in a sense, that's what the test is. Like the test is, can you find a, a way in which such a world would have to differ physically from our world? So it would be a contradiction with the premise that the world is exactly the same physically. Right. But the right. imaginability would be a, a slightly idealized notion. It, it involves... Exactly. Because it depends how much cognitive and computational firepower you have in order to recognize that after so and so many steps you actually it actually turns out that what seemed to be a feasible scenario actually turns out not to be possible exactly and then you have on the other side you have the problem that people who adhere to this view who are determined that certain things are impossible will simply claim that you only seem to be able to imagine them right so this is um, the case that we had discussed earlier where Saul Kripke claims, if you think that you can imagine unicorns, right, Kripke will claim you're only imagining things that appear like unicorns, but you're not really imagining the species because it's impossible to imagine a species right. that because, doesn't exist. Because we, we should listen yeah. to who haven't read Kripke, Kripke somewhat counterintuitively argues that unicorns don't just not exist. It's not just a zoological fact that they don't exist. They're in fact impossible, he minds, because maintains, because for them to be possible, they would have to be a biological kind of which they are instance, and, and there is no such biological kind, and there couldn't be. Sorry, but I didn't yeah. interrupt. No, that's right. And, and so, so he doesn't think it's a counterexample to that view when you insist, but I can imagine... Yeah, Disco the discovery of unicorns, and he says you only think you can imagine the discovery of unicorns. What you're really imagining is the discovery of horse-like creatures with horns. Yeah, but which aren't identical to mythological unicorns. But so as a result of which, it all becomes very fuzzy. It's not really easy to see how to apply this test very easily if people yeah. have such dramatically different intuitions about whether or not you can or cannot imagine certain kinds of things. So, so perhaps we could still uh, very briefly talk about the connection between aesthetic value and yeah. morality, because that is obviously um, an important and well-explored topic, right? The question to what extent the aesthetic value of a of art is uh, independent or autonomous of um, any kind of moral value or, or, or lack thereof that it, it might have. It would seem that different positions that you might take, the question of the phenomenon of imaginative resistance, in particular with respect to the aesthetic puzzles, would predispose one to take one or another view with respect to, the, to that question. Yes, I think, th I think that's right. Although it's, it's kind of an odd feature of the debates that they proceed more or less independently. Yeah. Um, so there is a there is a position um, in particular about ethical criticism that looks very much like a position in on imaginative resistance, even though these connections aren't usually drawn. Um, so Noel Carroll's view is that it's a flaw in a work if we're if we resist going along with it. Right. So if it fails to get us to engage in the way that it's meant to because it's morally reprehensible in some respect, that's a flaw. And that shows that a moral flaw can also be an aesthetic flaw. Right. And the usual counterexample to Carol's idea here is the case of, say, the Nazi watching Triumph of the Will. The Lenny Riefenstahl film. The Lenny Riefenstahl propaganda documentary, Triumph of the Will, which in essence glorifies Hitler and the Nazis. And, he, you know, it's pretty obvious that Nazis would have no trouble going along with it, right? Or with a fiction that glorified Nazis or Nazi-like characters or what have you. And so it looks like something like the mere psychological uh, resistance to going along with something doesn't necessarily indicate a flaw because that's very variable, whether people are willing to go along with a work or not go along with it. Right. Right. And so this is this is why this question of the fictionality puzzle seems to be potentially more relevant. Um, and the issue and the issue of but also the issue of a certain kind of refusal that seems to be aesthetically 
grounded. So why is it, I mean, the Homeric epics, are they really, it was Hume right about them, right? Is it really the case that because we don't like the morality and suppose we do resist going along with it and we just don't want to root for Achilles at all because he's so vicious, does that make the Homeric epics worse? I'm kind of inclined to say no, no, they're still really great. <laughs> and, and I mean, I, I have intuitions about these cases that go all over the place. I don't have a settled position. There are some cases in which it looks like the works are better in virtue of having more morally deviant um, backgrounds. So the examples that are usually used are things like the Sopranos. Yeah. So there are cases in which they they seem better because you're sympathizing with people who are really bad, and they wouldn't be as good if everybody you sympathized with was good. And it's part of the aesthetic appeal and the aesthetic value, presumably, that it makes it possible for you to actually experience that tension and to feel the sympathy for this character who uh, commits all kinds of heinous crimes. And still we feel for him because there's such a, the portrayal of his character is so rich that we see all these other sides to him. We see how he is torn and it's just such a richly drawn picture that it's, that we can't help but for him. Well, I say him as in Tony Soprano, but there are other characters as well in that. But is it, obviously that's, that's the sort of example that, that people like to draw on and, and I can see why, but is it the sort of example that Gendler would find fault with necessarily because it's not clear that the work of art is inviting us to buy into the value system held by by some new jersey mob boss right it, not at all <laughs> but yeah. um, there are these mor morally problematic actions that happen all the time obviously and nevertheless we sympathize and there's i mean there's something there's perhaps something even morally didactic about our experience of that tension within us that we're able to sympathize with someone that we that we on the other hand c clearly is a monster in, in some in some regards and, and so it's not at all clear that we're really invited to take fully take on board sort of morally deviant proposition in the in the way that we were discussing earlier in the in the sort of simpler uh, cases that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that these are definitely cases. These are precisely cases which don't prompt resistance in in the relevant sense. And I think Gendler has a good explanation of that. It's that we don't think that we're being asked to to feel this way about mobsters and murderers and and so on in in the real world. Yeah. And this, I mean, a good kind of example where it's the other way, which I've discussed elsewhere, is, is something like Gone with the Wind, in which the portrayals of the slave characters are extremely stereotypical in a, in a way that uh, modern audiences will find and should find disturbing. And in that case, we get the sense that we're supposed to export those attitudes. Right. Um, and, and then we do feel resistance, right? So it's very, it's, it is this very subtle kind of interpretive judgment where and this is one reason why i think that the discussion of imaginative resistance would be an interesting thing to bring into the ethical criticism debate because i think this is a relevant consideration the cases in which we think the works are flawed i think i mean morally flawed and therefore aesthetically flawed i think and there's onto something about why that is it's because we think the work is inviting us to export attitudes that we disagree with. And in the cases where we don't feel like we're being invited to export those attitudes, we yeah. feel perfectly happy to go along with it and, and even enjoy it, even enhances the work. Great, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that seems right. Good, well, we've been going for quite a while. Um, I don't wanna keep you any longer. I, I hope the uh, the listener will, will benefit from this. I, I for one, uh, forgot all about my weird gear and my very hot headphones and, and really, <laughs> really got into the discussion. So thank you so much Thanks. for taking the time and, 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 and uh, answering all my silly questions. No, not at all, it's been really interesting. Okay, we'll do it again sometime, Thanks. hopefully. Thanks so much for coming okay. on the podcast. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. Right. Bye. Take care. Bye.